So I'm going to be writing and talking, so which is one way I teach mostly. So you would be getting it all on the screen. Any questions of any kinds, you're welcome to ask me towards the end. We have talked about obscure GI hemorrhage already, and I thought that is small bowel hemorrhage. So I'll take lower GI hemorrhage because this is what most students were asking for. And when I say lower GI hemorrhage, I'm actually looking at uh, a very important and a very, very pertinent question. But this is one surgical problem which we need to um, address. I'm just looking at if I can write. And uh, hopefully I can now. Yes, I can. Now, I've written a surgeon's viewpoint because that's predominantly my viewpoint and evidence-based viewpoint. So it'll not be something that I only think and I don't use or practice. I'll keep telling you about the practical aspects of it too without mincing any words to make you understand the approach to a patient with lower GI hemorrhage. Now, it is important that we we are able to uh, understand what is lower GI hemorrhage. Now, this group has a very uh, important group that I have with me. That is my very dear undergraduates who need to be uh, given a insight into what exactly is a GIT division. And when we talk about upper GI, you are often taught in anatomy class, which is actually the anatomy of the dead. That's up to the ample of water or where the CBD opens. That's not correct. It the foregut changing into mid-gut. Remember that. And then it goes down to the ileocecal junction. And we have the ascending colon, cecum and ascending colon, transverse colon, descending and then this. Now, how do you know which part is mid-gut? There's people say lateral one-third of transverse colon. You can never measure it with an inch tape. So that, again, is the wrong way to approach it. It is actually to the point where middle colic artery is supplying. And beyond that is inferior mesenteric artery supplying. I'm sorry, the superior mesenteric artery supplying. So the part of the gut which is supplied by superior mesenteric artery is mid-gut, according to us. And part which is supplied by inferior mesenteric artery is the hind gut. And the division of foregut into foregut from mid-gut is based on the ligament of pride. Surgically, that's what works for us, nothing else. We don't look at ampulla of water as a division point. So remember that, that's important. Now, when we talk about lower GI, so essentially, what am I talking about? It's anything beyond the ligament of trites. So it'll have some part. Why do they call it obscure? It's not reachable by upper GI endoscopy or lower GI endoscopy. So There's a part in between. There's a gray zone in between. And therefore, what I say is hemorrhage somewhere. And you are finding it nowhere. Then hemorrhage is in small bowel. You didn't done the upper GI. You've done the lower GI. That's colonoscopy. Then the middle part, which is small bowel, that is called obscure GI hemorrhage. So I hope that's clear. We are talking about the one which is not obscure, but it is in the lower gut. So that's called lower GI hemorrhage. Now, there is a definition of massive and mild and what have you. And actually, the massive GI hemorrhage is a term which is used for 
an exsanguinating or hemodynamically significant bleeding and I don't want to make it more technical patient is in shock which requires at least it's persisting so it is exsanguinating hemodynamically significant which persists and requires at least four units in 24 hours that's called massive lower GI hemorrhage so they've therefore they're, they're divided into massive and mild to moderate. So what is massive GI hemorrhage? Hemodynamically, it makes a patient unstable. It's exsanguinating and it requires at least four units of blood. Again, if you go back to what I initially uh, discussed in the management of hemorrhage, you should know that, uh, I'm sorry, Uh, we talked about shock index, which I'm not repeating. This is how the terminologies are used today. You don't talk about pulse pressure. You don't talk about shock as simply pulse rate, blood pressure, etc. So this is heart rate divided by systolic blood pressure. I think you'll remember it forever now. I just discussed about shock index very clearly in the hemorrhage. If it is more than one, that's an objective division. So if the shock index is more than one, we are dealing with a massive GI hemorrhage. Massive. Because here, the heart rate is more, blood pressure is low. And the simple answer is shock index. If you answer technically in future, don't get lost into those textbook definitions. They confuse you and you end up answering averagely. The good answer is, when the shock index is more than one, I'm worried. It will naturally also be a situation where you need to give four units of blood. You know, when they're writing these definitions in the West, they're looking at their patients where the baseline hemoglobin may not be so bad. But if the baseline is very low, you may end up giving more. So that, or the loss is more. So more than four units persisting and with the shock index of more than one, that's how we'll define it. So I've given you a new definition of it. and you can understand it more clearly so that's massive if i want to talk about the other ones too i'll just finish it so we have a, a massive massive is one which i've defined then is mild to moderate now moderate is again a borderline mild is when it's bled and it is stopped this bleeding has stopped actually a lot of these patients don't require any treatment later on they may actually go back home they don't need any investigations it can stop patient is hemodynamically stable the shock index is grossly less than one that's what it is and it is bordering one and patient needs admission this needs to be investigated so which of the two needs to be admitted moderate one and massive one which is the one that can go home mild one that also becomes a criteria for admission. When you're admitting, you'll actually investigate. And mind you, investigations don't yield much. In more than 10% cases, you won't be able to find the cause. That's why the reason it's an enigma. That's why I thought I'll discuss it with you and end up some of the controversies that stay. Now, what is what is usually the source in general in lower GI hemorrhage? It is not always, but in general, right? Majority is from colon. And remember, we'll mostly talk about the majority. Remember that. So naturally, that's why it's correctly called lower GI hemorrhage. But rarely proximal to ligament of trites. Although it's an upper GI bleeding, it will manifest as lower GI bleeding if it is massive. Because it cannot stay there and you it will trickle down. That's less, 11%. It's commoner in men. It increases 200 fold times if you're asked the question especially the undergraduates are very keen on knowing when what what is the percentage there's a 200 fold increase from third decade of life onwards where the diabetic 
angiodysplasias are the cause. Remember, diverticulosis is the most common cause in the West. Angiodysplasia is the most common cause in the elderly. And angiodysplasia occur mostly in the right colon. Therefore, most common cause, source of these bleeding in the elderly is in the right colon. Evidence unknown as no standard technique for localization. You don't have an absolutely accurate technique. Like I mentioned about obscure GI hemorrhage, you may actually not be able to make a diagnosis. And you still would call it the hemorrhage that you're referring to. Vast majority are self-limiting, which is good news. And hemodynamically, they don't bother you at all. So you can actually, uh, don't you don't need to bother much all the time. So what, if you're talking about the source, colon mostly. And if I talk, about, I'm talking about colon, I draw it like this, sigmoid rectum. This is where angiodysplasia are. So this is the most common site. Diverticuli can be anywhere. They can be more commonly here. That's diverticulosis. They also cause bleeding. There's a diverticulum in the small bowel, which is called Meckel's diverticulum, you know that. That also is a cause in young men, especially. These are angiodysplasias. You know, therefore, in the past, it was popular to do right hemicolectomy blindly. If the hemorrhage source was not found, they'll just remove the right colon. It's not practiced now, but it used to be a practice. When we didn't find a source, we used to just remove, uh, you know, this part. This part would go. Hoping that it will take care of bleeding. And we often thought we have, we have done it only to know that, no, it stopped on its own. Because many a times it stops on its own. We give credit to the surgeon. Mostly the credit goes to the patient and also to uh, partly the surgeon, yes. The, the other reasons could be it can happen in about 11%, as I mentioned, proximal to ligament of tried. So it can be a... Is it possible for an upper GI hemorrhage to manifest as lower GI hemorrhage? It is. If, it is, if you just have a cup to fill and you have a uh, bottom is filled, with you've got a big pit, so bottom can be filled if the cup overflows. So... That's what is the principle here. Uh, moving on. We have to look at, look at the causes now. We've looked at the sources, colon being the most common. Uh, obscure GI hemorrhage is about 10%, which is small bowel. Then upper GI can be 11%, which can contribute to lower GI. Easy to remember. Right side angiodysplasia is common. Elderly angiodysplasia, because there are AV malformations. They happen later due to atherosclerotic changes. That's what it is related. Diverticulitis is the most common cause. And Meckel's diverticulum in young men is also a cause. But in the vast majority, we don't know the cause. So that's the summary of it. Now, what are the causes and how do we. Um, neoplasms. Are they common? They're common in the large bowel. Small bowel neoplasms are only 10% of total GIT. 10% of total GIT. 10% of all GIT are small bowel malignancies. So they're rare because they believe that the content moves so quickly that, you know, the cancer carcinogens cannot act. Inflammatory bowel disease in 11%, which includes inflammatory bowel disease, both ulcerative colitis and, you know, that Crohn's disease. They are all grouped together now. They can produce hemorrhage. Tuberculosis, does it produce hemorrhage? Not commonly. Because usually there is ischemic enteritis in tuberculosis. I mean, there is an end arthritis of the vessels. So that story about tubercle ulcer is round, typhoid ulcer is longitudinal, it's all pathologists uh, goof up. Uh, it's too small to be round or transverse, right? And when it's too small, how would it be round or transverse? Mostly it's just a puncture, as we see. And the reason why they don't bleed, it, bleed is because in the base there is a Arteries have thrombus. So they are ischemic as it is. So but what's the kind of uh, ulcer in the gut that is tubercular? Ischemic ulcer. Okay. Diverticulitis is 60%, mind you. So you understand what I meant by the most common cause? This is the most common cause. Ischemic colitis, not common. Again, vascular malformation like angiodysplasia is 3% only. But the percentage is more in elderly. Please understand what I said. It's not that the percentage is overall high. You won't get angiodysplasia in younger people, no? So elderly will have angiodysplasia as the commonest cause. 
but diabetic colitis so far that's what will remain diabetic close to diabetic colitis well interestingly 14 percent are hemorrhoids now how would that be counted as a as a lower GI bleed many reasons i'll tell you i'll show it to you in the next slide as i draw it sigmoid is a big reservoir hemorrhoids bleed anal verge is open is closed so the blood collects in the sigmoid and passes on later so to a foolish clinician who would not examine the rectum properly he would miss the hemorrhoids and will attribute it to sigmoid or colon while it can be easily due to hemorrhoids so you need to look at that that there is no case of lower GI hemorrhage where proctoscopy is not done if you don't do it it's criminal of course post-operative anastomotic bleed can happen Nichols diverticulum as I told you in younger patients I have seen it happen in many patients so I rated to about 20% of why what I have seen but that's not what the literature says and it's about evidence-based medicine not eminence-based medicine any infection especially typhoid I'll put it here so that undergraduates don't get confused typhoid can produce bleeding and also tubercular lesions can bleed although they have the enteritis and and arthritis in immunosuppressed individuals it can all bleed in immunosuppressed individuals now I was talking to you about hemorrhoids so the common uh, this is how we look at the section but if you draw transfer I mean cross section three o'clock seven o'clock and eleven o'clock these are called primary hemorrhoids because they occur at these positions any other hemorrhoid wherever it happens is a secondary hemorrhoid right primary anywhere else it is secondary and any fissure that happens at six o'clock and twelve o'clock is primary and wherever else it happens it is secondary so that's easy to remember the hemorrhoids can bleed and the blood can collect in the sigmoid as I said and it can cause bleeding the usual bleeding procedure and then you can have hemorrhoids now some right student can always ask this question how would you rule out if they are hemorrhoids as well as the upper GI bleed or lower GI bleed well you need to exclude hemorrhoids first and they're not difficult to exclude because they're visible then you can ban them and if the bleeding is still happening it could still be excluded because of collection all hemorrhoids all bleedings all lower GI hemorrhages would require a colonoscopy so you would be able to find it out so don't get worked up on that but major causes you've already seen are covered in that now the sources of obscure GI bleeding which I have already told you but I'm going to just highlight so that you don't have any confusion about any aspect I'll deal with all of them they are bowel and your dysplasias 40 percent can you believe that and they are obscure so, so hemorrhage somewhere hemorrhage nowhere hemorrhage in the small bowel is true mostly but you can still have angiodysplasia occurring even a large bowel on the right side then you can have small bowel leomyoma adenocarcinoma seven percent see the majority major chunk is dysplasia angiodysplasia it's not common there please understand this Crohn's small bowel lymphoma six percent meekles in four percent and leomyosarcoma in three percent and colorectal cancer in three percent i don't want you to worry about it viruses and and uh, the other causes three percent each others are grouped as ten percent so this slide you can keep with you and may maybe it'll help you understand so angiodysplasias 40 percent small bowel leomyomas are the next common the adenocarcinoma which is not so common per se so that's how you will look at it in terms of the distribution and also in terms of what we understand from the 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 lower GI hemorrhage and the source so source needs to be understood so that we can manage now there's a pathway to reason how do you adopt a pathway now the headings are not out of any book so therefore you'd find them entirely as I like to look at them so I would not like to make it into a copybook description 
which I find very boring and not very enjoyable. You should understand it. That's what my aim is. And you will like it. That's what it is. The experience with and without perception of lower GI hemorrhage differs slightly from one surgeon to the other. So therefore, there is no one method of doing it. And you should understand that there cannot be one method of doing it. So that's one thing I wanted to make to you wanted you to understand. So it will vary. I have observed mostly the cause happening uh, due to Mikkels in younger people, angiodysplasia in elderly, and rarely people find out. But I've also seen small bowel infectious disorders with its ischemia, ischemic enteritis, but which has become fulminant now. So we've seen many causes. It can change with from surgeon to surgeon. And it is understandable because we don't have any, you can't conduct a, conduct a, uh, I mean, understand, I mean, you can't have a retrospective studies on poorly stratified, stratified patients. So most are retrospective and they're poorly stratified patients. So you can't, it is, it is understandable that it will vary from surgeon to surgeon and also from uh, one institution to the other. So that's one thing to understand as you go along. Now, as a matter of fact, if you really look at it, despite the abundant diagnostic modalities available, attempts to localize the hemorrhage and its source would be would fail in as many as 12% cases, which is a big percentage where you won't find a reason. So it's not that every time we have known what is the cause. So once you don't find out, how can you be so sure that you will be able to analyze that this is the number. So that's also important. Some facts which you should remember. All right. As we move on, As a matter of fact, they're all coming to you as matter of facts. So I have not divided it in your classical tabular form, which the books do, which is not very understandable or enjoyable. Most invasive GI hemorrhage would uh, occur in elderly either from where? I've given it already colonic diverticulum. This is the observation that I found. And they say in the left, which is common, Less commonly right colon. I've talked about it already. Right side, angiodysplasias, and left side, diverticulitis. And that's what it shows, right? Angiodysplasias, most on the right side. This is common and stick to it. It'll work. And this is also what most authors have found. Now, although the dis angiodysplasias are common, but one does not know how often they bleed. So what I have seen happening is, you resect the colon, you send it to the pathologist, he doesn't know when I bleed. Pathology has never seen anything bleed ever. So because they deal with the dead, dead specimen. So they'll find angiodysplasia. And they'll report angiodysplasia found. So we think we've got a diagnosis. No, but we don't know how often they bleed. They don't bleed actually very often. That's what I want to tell you. And it's important to understand. So be careful on that aspect. Now a word about angiodysplasia so that the confusion is sorted out once for all. They are readily identified by angiography, which is a very good um, tool. That's why a lot of people think CT angiography is the first investigation that you do. Because it indicates the diagnosis. It also shows whether it's bleeding or not. And you can also use the therapeutic angiography to block it. We'll, we'll discuss that as I go along. So they can be identified by angiography or endoscopy. The incidence is higher in chronic renal failure patients. We know that. The patients on dialysis are at high risk of what? Angiodysplasias. The patients of chronic renal failure are at a high risk of what? Angiodysplasias. Angiodysplasias are commonly seen in patients receiving dialysis. In which group of the fall, which of the following angiodysplasias are not seen commonly? Those receiving dialysis. Those with chronic renal failure. Or those that are young these are the ones where you don't see it so that's your way of answering and learning about subject so no mcqs here it is seen in elderly or those on dialysis or chronic renal failure they may present with overt that is obvious or occult hemorrhage 
So it can just be melina or it can be uh, frank bleeding or it may be ble bleeding which is stopped. It's to be self-limiting. Their optimum treatment is controversial as the less than 10% they bleed ultimately. So what is this fuss about therefore? And your dysplasia is nobody knows how often they actually cause the damage that we attribute it to. So they may not bleed at all. It's less than 10% as I was saying. So very often we don't see angiodysplasia bleeding. We see angiodysplasia more often, but not all of them bleed. And most episodes, they stop spontaneously. But they have a high rate of recurrent hemorrhage. So either they were not the cause, you fixed it. So it continues to happen naturally because you haven't fixed the cause or they tend to re-bleed each time. Nobody knows. Less than 10% angiodysplasia bleed. They are more common on the right side of the colon. They are co more common in patients on chronic, on dialysis for chronic renal failure. They don't bleed that frequently. They are associated with recurrent hemorrhage. Nobody knows the right management because they don't bleed that often. So if you have fixed angiodysplasias, that doesn't ensure no re-bleeding because the bleeding can happen from where it actually was happening in the first place. We had never fixed it. And in addition, the last part is very, very important. Since the bleeding develops in the seventh or eighth decade, morbidity of treatment becomes worse than the disease. So nobody knows whether they need to be treated. You just keep replacing the RBCs and they live, live and they stop bleeding. So nobody knows as to how much. It's quite an enigma if you really look at it. So remember, I'm repeating it for the benefit of all the undergraduates and also the postgraduates, not that there's a difference. So, angiodysplasias, right colon, more common, 70s and 80s, only 10% bleed, re-bleed is common, recurrence, recurrence could be due to some other cause and finally since they happen at more than 80 years of age the treatment worse than disease may not need anything therefore that's it and the neoplasms now they are the second most common cause of small bowel of hemorrhage which I've already mentioned I've said that 10% 11% it says one third of this all small bowel lesions only 30% are small bowel cancers and of all they are less than 10% so very very rarely but colorectal cancers can produce bleeding because they as we know in and we often use it in uh, in cecum when we talk about the or the right-sided growth they produce melina because the hemorrhage bacteria will act on the blood and by the time the blood comes to the left side it is already black and tarry stool they have a tendency to bleed because they are ulcerative the left side are so they produce mostly obstruction and spurious diarrhea so that was the part I wanted to highlight colorectal cancers of course it will be important to uh, uh, important to take care of the uh, the hemorrhage of the colorectal cancers which can produce hemorrhage and we know that they do now carcinoids are they have a favorable prognosis amongst all these small bowel tumors just to discuss because we have published a, uh, a paper on this in Indian Journal of Cancer some years ago 2005 to be precise when we found that one cause of small obscure GI hemorrhage which for which I had to operate I found it was due to 
carcinoid of the small bowel, which was not only stenosing, but also it produced the hemorrhage. So it's important to, to make it a point that we explore the small bowel. And we found adenocarcinoid was the cause. And adenocarcinoid has a very bad prognosis. Carcinoids may not have that bad a prognosis. But adenocarcinoids have an element of adenocarcinoid in it. So that is what makes it bleed, and that's what makes it a poor prognosis, a prognostically poor cancer. And the prognosis of small bowel tumors depends on the stage at presentation, but overall they are an important cause, and we should address it. And uh, moving on, the diverticuli. Now the more important causes. The sigma diverticuli are the commonest cause. So I'm repeating it. Angiodysplasia is right side, diverticuli, left side. On left side, which is the largest sigmoid is the largest area that's where they found more commonly right so sigmoid diabetically are the commonest type and they are the most common cause of lower GI hemorrhage no problem easy to remember sigmoid is known for volvulus also for hemorrhage it's more common in elderly especially those taking uh, NSAIDs and decoagulants, bleeding can be massive. But let me tell you, they do better because you can resect it. If you can find the cause to fix it, it's not a problem. The major problem on the right side, angiodysplasias, carcinoids, obscure GI hemorrhages, you don't find a cause. But it's important to understand the massive and recurrent bleeding is common with diabetically. There are diabetically and some cases I'll share with you so that the picture stays st stuck, gets stuck in your mind. Now, these are the pseudo diabetically of the small bowel. And they're far less common than colonic. But we have seen them in quite a few cases. You can see one here. It has actually gone completely berserk. It's ruptured. And it was bleeding. Another case of these are diverticulae. Can you see a lot of diverticulae here? I'm sure you can. This is one. This is one. They're projecting outside and they bleed like hell when they do. Then 5% will be complicated by hemorrhage. It's jejunum common. And this was jejunum, mind you. You can see the volvule as it appears. So it's a jejunal diverticulae. Patient had a very poor, poor prognosis, was in sepsis, came as peritonitis, and it's an accident finding. We had to resort to resections and uh, multiple resections because a lot of gut had to go from here and from here. We had to remove the entire bulk and resection had to be done. They can be detected on enterocolysis, but missed mostly. You can see pooling of extravasated blood in the diverticulum. That's the way to diagnose it. They bleed and then the bag is full. And that's how you recognize, especially when you do endoscopy or you, after angiography. You can actually find that it's pooling into the, uh, it is pooling into the, into the diabetically. So they're not common in the small bowel, they're in the large bowel. Another one, see the picture? This is more clear. So I will just show you with, marking uh, this is a small bowel as you can see it's it's a stalk and that's the diverticulum it's undergone almost a necrosis so I'll use another color maybe you can see better this is it so it is going to be filled with blood so when you put in a scope if you can or if you do the mesentric or you do the angiography you can see the blood is pooling in here that's one way to diagnose it well so that's the way to um, these are the, the another one you can see the diabetic lay here again you can see the picture in a bigger frame you can see that it is leaking 
the content also this perforated in addition to the you can see that this is where it is given way and it's leaking this fluid content here which you can see and there there's one here which is not yet perforated but it is full of blood it was all blood filled so we dissected the whole of that part in order to get this completely removed arm block this is important well uh, so showing you some examples common ones i've shown you now the rare ones and i'll come to the management so all aspects would be covered the uh, tuberculosis as i said is rare and the reason i've given you is i'm repeating so that you don't ask me again and you should pay attention to it in tuberculosis they are ischemic ulcers which are due to and arteries have thrombus so they don't bleed but if there is no fibrosis or if there is no immunity then it will bleed so if you are asked the question which group of patients of tuberculosis would bleed have lower GI hemorrhage it is those who are immunosuppressed or on steroid therapy chemotherapy etc bazaars I've discussed in previous presentations also that's a bazaar somebody asked me in the morning case can bazaars produce gastric ulcers obstruction they do they can they can produce small bowel obstruction in this case patient came with a massive GI hemorrhage along with obstruction so we found a cotton bazaar in this case which we had reported uh, hemobilia is a term where the blood is coming with the bile in this common bile duct there is hemorrhage due to whatever cause it mixes up and comes down so that's also a hemorrhage vascular rare but aortoentric fistula has been seen and it is massive hemorrhage it forms a fistula with the aorta can it look for something bigger than that no so it is like you are connecting the river to the ocean at the wrong point so the ocean water will come into this river will become an ocean and if the river leaks from somewhere you'll have the blood the same thing happens here you're flooded with blood and you you kill you patient is dead before you can do much in in rarely reported cases you find that the leak has stopped due to infection or block and when you go in you just find a connection and a dilated bowel and you find that's connected to aorta you have to just got to disconnect it repair the aorta repair this part and it can work out fine that, that's how it happened in one case but how would it happen usually it is a connection in that case it was a bowel with a lymph node which was there which got stuck to the aorta and then the two got connected through a fistulous tract so the connection was very mild small connection but it with bouts it will fill and the patient would just lose blood and no source could be found and this was small bowel so you could not find it it's hemorrhage somewhere hemorrhage nowhere hemorrhage in the small bowel so patient was taken up for surgery and no preoperative diagnosis could be made and when we opened up we found there was a connection we couldn't make out if it's a lymph node you can just hypothesize clamps at two ends vascular clamp here bowel clamp here disconnect this is repaired this is repaired thank you very much the bleeding stops patient lived happily after that for some time we didn't know what was the cause probably could have been a lymphoma I was lost to follow over there maybe that would have been a very interesting case to discuss iatrogenic is of course if you've done some procedure like ERCP you've done colonoscopy you've done upper endoscopy, you can cause hemorrhage which can, which can produce lower GI hemorrhage so that's not common and you all obviously you have a cause so there's no problem there you can make it out so this was uh, uh, the, the publication that I was referring to which is about the bizarre being the cause it's not a common cause so bizarre is one entity and as, as I mentioned I'm repeating it here bizarre can go from the stomach down into the small bowel also called as the Rupunzel syndrome which is a lot of muck here the hair or cotton as in our case and tail going down that's a Rapunzel syndrome and this can cause erosions and bleeding they can be ulcers then they can be hemobilia due to pseudonism rupturing into it or into the duct there is a hemorrhage 
you've done an upper GI endoscopy or you've done a lower GI endoscopy can bleed. These are the causes and easy to remember. Moving on, that's a bizarre picture. If you want to see, it's very clearly seen here that uh, the small bowel is completely involved and we had to take it out through this perforation which is visible with the blade and uh, the small segment of small bowel had to be removed and the whole long, uh, the length of the bezoar had to be, this is the length of bezoar, this is bezoar and it's a tail, it's, it's a Rapunzel of a different kind, that is what we reported it as. And it came out of this little hole and we could resect it and that's the end of the matter as far as this was concerned. Well, to move on, uh, break. I actually clicked on the article and opened up the PubMed article of mine. So, sorry for that. We'll just move on. Now, coming to now the next step. Of making a diagnosis very important important part of what you do so I've discussed the causes and the sources and the presentation so that part is taken care of the usual referral patient has uh, Melina anything can hide behind such a note so poor way to refer that kind of a referral would not make you look like a good doctor patient has melina that's a poor way to refer so that would indicate what to me that not much of thought has gone into that request poor so you should be able to mention a good history is the most powerful tool and proctoscopy findings they should be provided in any referral that you're sending if you're bring it to a, a surgeon who has to manage the lower GI hemorrhage so just to write maybe commonly the residents patient is Melina it's a very poor way to do it must make that mention or be in your referral. So, when I'm saying uh, a referral, what are the points that I'm looking at? A good history and a proctoscopic finding. A lot of people don't use the term proctoscopy anymore, and I'm therefore using proctoscopy. Like we don't use PR examination anymore; we call it digital rectal examination. So terms are changing, and you must be careful in using it, especially the new trainees and especially my undergraduate students. They should learn the right way of writing it. Most people are still writing PR, DR, KR, AR. That is not done. Rectoscopy should be the first step before you make a diagnosis. And when you're doing it, you should be able to elaborately mention that the bowel was the rectum. If you could not see, you have to clean it up with saline to be able to do it. And do you know how often this is ignored in present day practice? Because I don't see the residents today putting their finger into the rectum and I'm not too sure after COVID either whether you'll get even close to the patient so that's where the trouble is but this is very commonly misstep and very often you find you've done everything and the patient is bleeding from the rectum 
it's a serious offense. And often the patient is immediately referred for pan endoscopy. Do everything. You do upper GI, you do lower GI, you get into the patient, you send another person inside, everybody goes in, finds out this bleeding, and you have to come out and tell the bleeding. Where is it coming from? That equity. Discover much blood. You mentioned that. It is possible you've done an endoscopy and you see nothing. Very often the report is so much blood, I can't see anything. Patient is really, really not to be honored from here to there. Uh, you need to find the source. If the blood can be aspirated and what one does not uh, does get to see the rectum, simple things like rectal cancer or type rectum red to make them and naturally this bottom line is very important. One does not want to find out an anal source at laparotomy because that will be shameful. And do you think I'm theoretical in this? No, practically I've seen it happen. We searched all around, it was actually the anal canal. Just missed, and you rely on each other's findings. Have you seen? You have seen. Do it yourself, and don't leave it to the junior most member in the team. He will miss it, and you will miss it because you've trusted him. If you see a lot of blood there, pushing in some saline, cleaning it up, and doing it a little, little while later, you'll be able to make a diagnosis. Very, very important. And DRE followed by dectoscopy is mandatory. So if I have to write one thing which you must do, in fact, two things which you must do. One is a good history. Take the history. Has he bled in the past also? Does he have any history suggestive of hemorrhoids? Does it have does he have any history suggestive of upper GI bleed in the past? Has he been on anticoagulants or not? Has he got some history of cancer which was in the past? Did he undergo some and procedure in the recent past, etc. History is very important. And then rectoscopy. And the rectoscopy should be able to show you at least a growth or rectitis or proctitis, as you can call it. You may not always be able to make a diagnosis, but at least you've made an attempt. You won't be embarrassed at the end. The cause was rectal, and we went into the abdomen looking all over, hammer and so What now? I'm explaining everything because it's very important for you to understand. Examine. I don't want to repeat it. It should not be separated when you're resuscitating. It should not be divided into three columns. That I'll take history first, then decide to resuscitate. Two large bowl cannula go in. You must replace blood. Send it for cross matching, and you should be able to revive the patient. Give a challenge, and you know the shock index will decide your fluid intake. That's why I last lecture was hemorrhage. Now we'll complete a complete series of hemorrhage from wherever. We have to cover lower GI, we'll take upper GI, we'll take hemorrhage so that you're finally done with it, including hematuria. So that you know what do you do, but broader vision I had given you. It is important to a certain nature and duration of bleeding, including stool color and frequency. Patient can give you a history of melina of six months duration. Then you know the bleeding is happening before. The cause is chronic, right? Important. History of pain, abdomen, bowel habits, fever, urgency, tenesmus, previous GI bleeding episodes, inflammatory bowel disease, NSAIDs. Needless to say, they are all important, and you know why. Now, the next history, very important. Whether the blood is pink fresh or maroon. The maroon blood is the red blood. You can't stay red with a mixture of bile, which is green. If you ever paint it, the red and green become blackish. When we paint, we combine the two to make black. Color, isn't it? We don't get black all the time. So red, red of the blood 
closer to NS is the source. This is how, how I look at it. So it will be graded accordingly. If it is more, more red, it's closer to the NS. If it is less red, it's higher up. So it's downstream how much will be known by the color. And a smart clinician will know as to what is the soul. And small vowel red is red, 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 reddish. Slightly black, but more red. No, it's large vowel up. It's from as you go upwards, pollution keeps on increasing. More the pollution, lower is the source. When it starts, it's not polluted. The tarry black stools, upper GI source, massive upper GI hemorrhage may appear in the term have mentioned so much of and guess quickly you know when you put in a nasogastric tube and irrigate the bleeding is very obvious and you can make out based on filling up you put in a nasogastric blood is coming you're looking at something in the and the patient also has you started uh, you know on blood you investigate it, it's a lower GI, GI, and if it is massive, as well as it might go up. So you should be prepared for that. Now the management, the management, and in management there are many things which are important. First of all, you don't manage a patient who is hemodynamically very low. So you have to stabilize him hemodynamically. And what do you use for assessment? Shock index. Try to bring it down to less than one. Because if it is more than one, you are looking at and you will pop it easily. But you need to plan ten more than four. You then localize the bleeding and then intervene for the local side. You just don't open up these patients and find nothing there and come out. And you lost the patient before you did the surgery. So that's not what one is recommended to do. Now, initial hemodynamic stability will be based on your assessment of the patient the proper way, which means you would be looking at the shock index. I'm repeating that. If it is more than one, you're dealing with a massive hemorrhage, bring it to one or less than one. So you need to give up to four units. There is a risk of giving massive blood transfusion and we discussed about rally in the quiz contest that you had UG's had in the conference uh, transfusion related acute lung injury give a fluid challenge and blood for blood volume may be less so you can give RBCs or the fresh blood or fresh fresh replacement is what you need to do now, uh, moving on, so you, uh, you have worked on the hemodynamic stability. Now you're looking at the sophisticated means of making diagnosis, which I'll discuss first, then I'll get down to what is actually the practice. Technetium label erythrocyte scan. Very popular for your MCQ masters. They ask this question, I don't know why, probably because it is never used. Very rarely you get utility-based questions. Technetium labeled erythrocyte scan. What is the problem? You label that erythrocyte with technetium. Good? Sounds very clever. When the RBC comes out of the wound or site, you can take a scan and see that's leaking. But if so many of them come out, how is he? See the massive hemorrhage, it may not be then sensitive and specific. In mild hemorrhage, it has no role. So it's self-controlling. So when you make a diagnosis, you can't be sure if you made the right diagnosis. Mesentric angiography is smart. So therefore, CT angio is what most people like to do first. That localizes even better. But again, mind you, if the hemorrhage is very little, you may miss or if it is massive, it may not be very effective. So patient hemodynamically unstable, don't play with these toys. They can actually 
make you lose time and you may actually lose your patient. Now, which of the two to be chosen would depend on the intensity of bleeding, as I mentioned. Technician labeled mild bleeding, mesenteric angiography for major. Why major mesenteric angiography? If you can then do interventional angiography and also do selective angiography and selective en um, embolization. Even if you don't embolize, what you can do is you embolize, you localize the site, you can go in and fix it there and there. So mesenteric angiography turns out to be better. I've never seen a technician labeled erythrocyte scan being used. I'm sure those who use it uh, must be very good at it, but it won't indicate much. And I don't think many people fancy it, especially surgeons, the more clear headed people who have to fix things, so they need to know. More profuse the bleeding start with angiography, as I've mentioned. If it is more profuse, do that. Both investigations require a bleeding patient. Needless, if the patient has stopped bleeding, nothing would be leaking. So we are, we are banking on what? Leaking of the isotope or leaking of the contrast. If the leaking is stopped, there is no role. But do not waste the radiologist's time on a non-bleeding patient. If the patient is not bleeding, he'll do nothing. He'll know, he'll know nothing. He'll just keep telling you around it and never rely don't treat a ct treat the patient if the patient is hemodynamically unstable repeating again and again make him stable and you can go in and find a cause rather than leaving it to the radiologist to tell you till the cows come home and you won't be able to do anything at that point of time so massive hemorrhage ct angiography mild hemorrhage technician scan mild hemorrhage you don't need to do anything anyway so find out you can do that selective mis mesenteric angiography extremely useful Therapeutic mesenteric angiography, and nowadays with localization and I mean, I'm, uh, putting the doing them. This I've seen it being used. I'm very familiar with it. It was done even recently in one of our patients where actually they could embolize the bleeder and it could stop. When the patient gets all right, we can go in and operate. I hope that is clear because that's very, very important to understand. So it is not necessary to do the fancy ones. Role of CT in these patients is quite, quite remarkable. It's very useful. The advantage of CT is, uh, is uh, diagnostic for various intraluminal causes. You can find a malignancy. You can even find a contrast leaking. You can find a cause. And inflammatory bowel disease, it will show the so you can make a diagnosis, it's still a more useful one. And when they talk about spiral or helical CT, it has replaced enterocolysis, which used to be done in the past, push enteroscopy, enteroclysis, they're not very commonly used now. Now, therefore, we'll do, the first test that I'll do in a patient is such a thing. If I can find a patient who's hemodynamically stable, it would be a helical CT, contrast and CT scan. That's what is going to guide me to the source, underlying cause, and a possible severity of the condition. It will also exclude some conditions like malignancies, um, meekles maybe, or even inflammatory bowel disease. So important to do that. Now the meekles scan is a term which you commonly ask about and you should be familiar with. Like I said, it is a very uh, important cause in a lot of scenarios which are manifesting as lower GI hemorrhage. In about 2% individuals, rule of two, you know that. It is about two centimeters long. It's about two feet proximal to ileocecal junction. And in 2%, it may have the ectopic gastric mucosa. Now, in these patients, it can bleed, and that can produce a lower GI hemorrhage. Very treatable condition. A mecal scan is done in these patients, if you're asked a question. What is mecal scan going to pick up? Ectopic gastric mucosa. That's it. No rocket science. It picks it up, and we know that's the cause. We can even go laparoscopically, get this mecal diverticulum removed, or we can do resection and anastomosis by open technique, and we can manage it. The parietal cells in the gastric mucosa may take up technician 99M which is detected on gamma camera. So even here it is technetium 99M, which is picked up by what? 
parietal cells, which are P cells. P cells produce uh, acid, no? You know that in stomach we have P cells, parietal cells. They, if the gastric mucosa goes to the Nichols diverticulum, the P cells will go there. They'll pick up technetium 99M, and that will be picked up by gamma camera, so you can make a diagnosis. And especially in 20s and 30s, when the individual is in 20s and 30s, this can be a cause, and you shouldn't forget it. I mentioned it here as the bottom line. It's the most common cause of small ball bleeding in patients less than 30 years of age. Will you remember that? Most common cause of hemorrhage in patients that are less than 30 years of age is Meckel's diverticulum with P cells in the in the gastric mucosa, which is ectopic, which will pick up 99M, technetium 99M. Now, fancy investigation, which is very useful, very commonly done. It's a wireless capsule video endoscopy. So you're often asked, what is WCVE? Wireless capsule video endoscopy. It is very simple. What we do here is there is no wire. There is a capsule. It has a video recorder and it has an endoscope, all built in one. So this capsule we make the patient. So this is tiny imaging capsule with a light source, a video camera, battery, antenna, radio transmitter. It's like a small robot that you ingest. It goes through your stomach, through the small bowel, the large bowel. And then finally it comes out. You collect it. It takes pictures of the entire GIT. And it can keep transmitting on your software twice each second the pictures. Then signals are digitally recorded on a device that is later downloaded. The capsule is not to be disposed of. The patient has to collect it, so it's passed tool in. Needless to say, it cannot be reused. This should not be done because it's taken a different journey. Patient swallows the capsule in the morning and wears the recording sensors for eight hours, so the sensors keep recording it. So that's a video endoscopy wireless capsule. It just goes in, but it can miss out certain areas. There are some blind spots for even this. And what are those? It can be, it may actually, as it goes down, mind you, it is going along with the peristalsis. It doesn't have its wisdom. It goes down here, it goes down. It can miss here. So fundus is missed. It can miss. All the corners, like ligament of trites, it can just go here, come back. Then in the large bowel, it can miss all the flexures. It can go miss it, miss it. And in sigmoid, it can go crazy because it goes S-shaped. So we actually can be missing out. But reasonably good method. And you can also do what is called as virtual colonoscopy. But you rely on on just the imaging to find out any cause of lesion in the large bowel or small bowel. And we are clear on this that it is a very useful method. And the best thing is the only problem is it is expensive. It needs all the equipment, needs the capsule. You need to wear those sensors. It is being used by gastroenterologists very commonly. Now, how does it compare with the push enteroscopy? And first of all, for that, you need to understand what is push enteroscopy. Now, push enteroscopy is invasive. This capsule is not invasive. It's simple. Even this is no rocket science. That it is superior. And uh, it gives a much better cross-sectional imaging. Push enteroscopy and cross-sectional imaging is not very effective. And it identified in many studies in 70% versus 
45 percent with push endoscopy i'll tell you what is push endoscopy so this capsule endoscopy is superior to push endoscopy in the, based on evidence also and this is the evidence so everything that is reported here is based on evidence 70 versus 45 is almost twice the push endoscopy is a concept which is based on the use of a pediatric sigmoidoscope it is introduced long it gets into the small bowel negotiated from here only and then you try to get an idea by pushing it through and a lot of people then put in a laparoscope inside and they put the bowel on it so it keeps going like you put this is a small bowel that's a push endoscope we keep taking the bowel on the endoscope with the laparoscopy instrument the grasper so that you're able to study the whole small bowel naturally invasive not very easy to do sometimes you have to do a laparotomy for this because you have to enter from one place and push it across so it's like studying from inside and capsule endoscopy is when you can go completely with the capsule so push enteroscopy it's called push enteroscopy remember that that is a term now you can also do intraoperative enteroscopy which is the gold standard the gold standard is not always the best you might Because you are inside the abdomen, you have got into the abdomen, you can enter through any source into the small bowel through maybe the the entering the thing which are fine otherwise. Or during exploratory laparotomy or laparoscopy, endoscopy, endoscopists can perform. You know, endoscopist has put in the scope and you open up the abdomen. You can use that colonic pediatric colonoscope and negotiate it through. It can also be done with uh, with the uh, use of uh, I mean, you can also do an enterotomy for the same purpose. I have described that, so that part is covered. Now, a word about you are asked this question, therefore, you should know about it. Uh, tech 99 technetium tagged RBC scintigraphy, which is still used. It's a nuclear medicine facility, is mandatory. So, nuclear imaging modality to tag patients' own RBCs. Older method was using 99M technetium labeled sulfur colloid largely abandoned now now the technique to document intestinal bleeding rates as low as 0.5 ml per minute i mean so little bleeding can be detected and you're not surprised because it can just pick up the rbcs that are tagged with 99 uh, m technetium technetium 99 m so it can be tagged with that and then you can see a gum with a gamma camera you can actually see that so it's usually identified a potential source slow to moderate bleeding I don't think it's practically very useful because that small to moderate bleeding uh, will it will not be very useful in a massive bleed because everything will be washed out. There will be a lot of blood that will come out so you won't be able to catch it. With massive bleeding, patient is hemodynamically unstable. We will prefer angiography which I am repeating again and again. We will not rely on, if there is massive hematochesia and the hemodynamic instability is there, then we will not be able to uh, uh, basically appreciate it there's a massive bleeding now active bleeding can be identified in about 75 percent cases and it's not rocket science because the blood is losing and you can put it on the scanner it's much easier but intermittent bleeding allows for delayed imaging three to six you can pick it up the advantages we are looking at intermittent bleeding allows delayed imaging which you can do three to 36 hours if the patient develops a repeat hemorrhage so it is useful but only when the bleeding is mild to moderate very little bleeding it can pick up 0.5 ml per minute blood bleeding also which is a very fine tuning of the source you can do that then it can also uh, be used for later on assessment if the patient loses uh, develops re-bleeding so that is the role of 99m technician now the take home from all this i don't want to you to get confused with anything you'll have an answer which is my purpose take home is which i have observed and it is also documented the reports by radiologists boasting about high accuracy rate accuracy rate of 
isotope scans and angiography are meaningless because such reports do not discuss the clinical benefits of such accuracy that is did it change the management and how most of the time it does not change the management and uh, it did not when the bleeding was so little that it did not need anything or it was so massive that they don't need them or it's it has stopped and you wasted your time so be clear on that don't take them as gospels these are uh, these are methods to basically discuss selectively now i'm coming to what is more useful in the management selective mesenteric angiography this provides a diagnostic as well as the therapeutic options so obviously it's ideal you can control control the hemorrhage by marking of the small segment actually if the bleeding has stopped suppose it has stopped this is the point you make up made out and you can mark it with a clip or you can mark it somehow and you know where it is so when you go in you can locate and you can re remove it and angio displays years successful in up to 60 percent of patients which is fairly good considering the hemorrhage gets gets very very difficult to manage and especially to diagnose so selective mesentic angiography is the way to go ct scan is a non-invasive way to go invasive is selective mesentic angiography after you've done ct angio There is a term Cush enteroscopy, which I didn't cover there, so that's why I've kept it here. Uh, this is actually small ball endoscopy. You don't have a scope which reaches the small ball, and small ball is six meters long. So it, it amounts to sending an intern or postgraduate inside the abdomen, get GIT, goes around with a torch to find the bleeding. So what do you do? You push small bowel endoscope, more commonly used limitation in awake patient. Very difficult because patient will be burping, jumping. You go beyond the ligament of trites here into jejunum, and then something has to be negotiating the forward pushing. It picks up malformations, telangiectasia, diverticular, etc. There's also a term which you'll hear. This is a sewn pull enteroscope, which is a double sheath. You pull the out one, the inner keeps going. All sorts of maneuvers have been tried. Now, what what people have I've seen doing? The scope is a colonoscope of the pediatric age group used in adults now because the length you need. You negotiate it like upper GI endoscopy beyond ligament of trites and some opening has to be made with the scope and with a grasper you keep on taking the bowel on it and you are able to inspect it. That's how you do it. And importantly, that's enteroscopy. Now colonoscopy. I'll come to the final management very quickly. Procedure of choice for lower GI hemorrhage has to be done. If I have to sum it up here, upper GI endoscopy, lower GI endoscopy, both are done. But which one I'll do first? Naturally, the lower GI. Or maybe upper GI. Sometimes the upper GI is the cause. So I put in a nasogastric tube. I find blood coming, not coming. Angiography is reserved for massive ongoing bleeding when colonoscopy failed or not feasible. Clear? Easy. So massive bleeding and geography. Lower GI bleeding, colonoscopy. Upper GI bleeding, upper GI endoscopy. Obscore GI bleeding, enteroscopy. Can it be done? Cannot be done. Theoretically, yes. What, what is enteroscopy? Push enteroscopy. What is used for that? The pediatric colonoscope. Is it invasive? It is very invasive. When you do the technician 99 minimal blood loss, it can pick up up to 0.5 ml per minute per hour. Repeat bleeding, you can do the scan. Mecal scan for 20s and 30s patient. Again, 99 ml technician scan using gamma camera based on parietal cells picking it up from the gastric mucosa. So this is a summary of what you would normally do. The take home and for each Statement that I make there is a take home and you must therefore concentrate on the take home It is known That colonoscope is often over diagnosed various lesions as the source of hemorrhage as sees before they start doing it like I mentioned earlier They make a diagnosis of a diverticulum, but that is present and it may not be bleeding 
but they make a diagnosis and you may get a wrong diagnosis as a surgeon you should be careful about it you should believe it to be the cause but after the bleeding has stopped nobody can actually tell you for sure if that is a source and that is to be remembered now what is a surgical drill now comes the role of surgery what do you do if the patient is not settling remember laparotomy don't waste time but don't go in for laparotomy without hemodynamically stabilizing the patient you will lose him and you will search and search and search you won't be able to find the cause remember and you have done laparotomy now what do you see quick examination of colon to exclude obvious pathology that's the next step and keep focusing on the large bowel as a cause first look for it find out the cause exclude the cause in inspecting the small bowel that may contain blood even if bleeding continues from the comes from the large bowel because you may have a source in the small bowel but it's pooling up in the large bowel and you may confuse it and Unu unusual for the blood to regurgitate throughout this entire small bowel so the entire small bowel or most of it is full and large bowel is also full where is the source small bowel it's rare to get it going backwards some amount can go into the terminal ileum i've seen it happen if the ileocecal wall is incompetent which happens in about 20% cases then it can fill back but most of the time it will be if the small bowel is full the large bowel is also full the cause is mostly in the small bowel if blood is found in the upper small bowel direct the investigation to the upper git which is what i just told you if it is the larger part lower down lower gi bleeding if it is in the upper part, small bowel only, upper part has blood. Where is it coming from? From the upper part. So put in a scope. Even on the table, it can be done. And what is multiple clamp technique? I'll just share with you. That is, if you have uh, the abdomen is all opened up and you don't know where the cause is, say this is the small bowel. I tried to make it as long as I could on this. And that's the large bowel. You find that there is blood in here. The source is here in the small bowel. If you find it all full and blood is just confined to this part, I'll use another color for that, don't worry. Blood here and only here, the cause is here. Regurgitation might happen. But if the blood is here only and not lower down, I must do an upper G endoscopy in this patient. But if there's blood in this small bowel and I'm looking at what to do and I'm not able to do any endoscopy, so this is multiple clamp technique. We use a bowel clamp and clamp two sides and we see if this wells up. If it does not, when you remove this clamp, we move to the next. If it wells up, there'll be collection inside. Then if it doesn't, then we move further. So it's multiple clamp technique. You keep walking. And wherever in between the two clamps you find it's welling up, that's a source. And that's a very simple method which I adopt in doing the resection of the source. Because what have I done? Each time that I've clamped it on both sides, if there's bleeding, it'll well up. So if it wells up, then the source is here. If it does not, say it remains like this on. Then I remove this to the distal, distal part, and that's how it, I keep walking. And I pick up the spot, some segment, and then I can do limited resection in that. That's how that's a multiple clamp technique which you should know practically. Now, are you going to take a chance with a right or a left hemicolectomy? Whenever there was a doubt, we did a right hemicolectomy, which meant we removed the right, uh, the ascending colon, cecum, and the part of transverse colon, because most of the time we thought the cause was angiodysplasia, which is not the which is not true. So many people would still do right hemicolectomy, which is called 
blind right hippocampus like is it should it be done it should not be done you must localize do you trust the pre preoperative localizing studies if performed we trust we need to but we can't do blind can you identify the bleeder with certainty you can't not even if you open or clean the colon can you should be surely see the bleeding site it is messy and takes time therefore the traditional teaching method is blind right have a colectomy assuming and just dysplasia as the cause this used to be the practice which is not done now because angiodysplasia are not the most common cause i have done blind right have a colectomy in in situations where we could not control we did not know where the blood was coming from these days with localization studies being rampant and available it is no longer possible to do blind colectomy if you have to do a blind one also we do what is called a sub what, what am i trying to say when i saying the subtotal colectomy the subtotal colectomy is nothing you see the whole logic here please pay attention as i tell you the logic here is uh, it is better than blind right hip colectomy which is the major problem why this term came when you found no cause we did resection of this thinking that angiodysplasias would be here but they are not always there they are not the cause so these patients would rebleed and that would mean we have to go for surgery second time by this time they are too sick to undergo any surgery so there was a controversy as to what do you do and still there is a counter controversy not that everybody accepts it but i'm sharing with you one thought so a lot of people feel that you should do a subtotal colectomy that is remove the ascending colon cecum transverse colon descending colon and sigmoid and then do ileorectal anastomosis this is ilia which you brought bigger because this would be blind also but you don't have to there is no rebleeding and therefore no second surgery and this is your best chance and there are studies to show that this is more beneficial than doing blind hemicolectomy that's what i'm saying must localize and treat if you cannot localize blind right hemicolectomy no blind subtotal then that is what i was trying to indicate now blind left or right hemicolectomies the answer is sorry none of them no blind right or left hemicolectomy if you have decided to go blind you would rather go for subtotal rather than nothing should be blind but if at all you have to do anything blind you know why because you may not be able to confine the cause to one part of the colon so if you are going to do blind anyway it should be only one attempt when the patient is fit and you won't be able to do it again so don't leave a chance for rebleed which will be a problem now this is the term that i was referring to i already explained to you so i'll uh, it is advisable as there are instances when colon is so full of blood that nothing can be seen and temporary clamping of three main vessels to colon while mobilizing the colon so what do we do the technique is also to be understood and the technique is based on the logic again based on the logic that i was referring to and i'll explain it to you So this is the ileo colic, right colic, middle colic, inferior mesenteric. We'll have left colic, the hemorrhoidal branches. If you ligate them before you mobilize, the bleeding stops, and then you can mobilize and remove. Well, I'm trying to just say when you are doing subtotal, because the chances of it'll be blind anyway. But the, if it is all loaded with blood and you have no choice, and surgically you lost everything. it is better to do rather than doing hemicolectomy which will be morbid and some total is slightly more morbid but the advantage is you don't have to go in second time so therefore a lot of people recommend that that should be the way 
So let's face it, what is exactly done is important. So in nine out of 10 patients, the bleeding stops spontaneously. The emergency localizing tests are unnecessary in this group. Elective colonoscopy is indicated. I hope you did understand the take home. So you don't have to do emergency localizing tests because in nine out of ten it stops. Hysterical physicians often over investigate this group, the group jumping on them and with isotope scans and angiograms, all useless when the hemorrhage is not active. I hope that I've made clear. Each of us operates perhaps two or three times a year on massive low GI hemorrhage. It's not common. And most people don't know what is the best treatment because when you have sporadic cases, data is not compiled, studies are not clear. Guidelines are there, they're UK guidelines. And I'll sum it up, sum them up for you. So the collective experience of each hospital is not enough to reach a meaningful conclusion. And all that is published on this subject is therefore retrospective and biased by local dogma and facilities naturally. So in all situations, when you know that nine out of 10 will stop. So forget about those fancy tests to a colonoscopy. There's no role of mesenteric angiography. Scans are of course, mostly useless and then you can investigate with colonoscopy, apogee, endoscopy and move on. You don't need to do any fancy test in a patient who's very sick. You have to go into the theater and do whatever you can. But in cases where you have to, then selective mesenteric angiography is still an option which will localize the bleeding and can embolize the bleeding and make your surgeon's job easier. And when in doubt, take it out. And in taking it out, don't take out the right colon or left colon. Then subtotal colectomy has to be done. Call for help and it should be done. Now, what is the summary of the approach, therefore? It should be very clearly understood. I think that will sum up the treatment. Supportive care. Start with the supportive care. Exclude upper GI bleeding. How do you exclude it? by doing what is uh, uh, what is visible and upper GI endoscopy can exclude upper GI bleeding. Rectoscopy to exclude an anorectal source. These are steps you must follow. Supportive care, exclude lower upper GI bleeding by upper GI endoscopy. How do you exclude it? Put in a nasogastric tube, blood is not coming, that's a crude method and you can lavage it or you can do an upper GI endoscopy which is easily done. When you're in colonoscopy, upper GI can be done. Then do a rectoscopy. This is clinical. When the patient requires second or third unit of blood, it's time to get a little excited. This is when you should be worried. Up to one or two units, it's fine. And this is when you should do mesenteric angiography. You should do angiography. I'm telling you the take home and you should stick to that. Start with supportive care. Exclude upper GI bleeding. Rectoscopy to exclude an anal anorectal cause. And when the patient requires second or third unit, it is time to get a little excited. Angiography is that this is the best time. You're in the middle of a patient being otherwise fine. And uh, what is the role of nuclear medicine? Well, it is with a purpose nuclear medicine or unclear medicine because this has got minimal role. And they will confuse the hell out of you by the time you really take a call. It'll be too late in the day. If angiography localizes a source in left or right colon, so much the better. Then you can do right or left hemicolectomy. If angiography can localize a source, if it fails, not a big deal. Isotope scans require time and clinically almost useless in actively bleeding patients. So. We don't want it clinically almost useless in actively bleeding patients and if the patient is not actively bleeding you don't have to do surgery so don't worry about it blood migrates within the lumen of the colon and so do the ex extra visited isotopes so much migrates that most do not value this investigation so i won't waste a lot of time talking about it it's just theoretical and they are very excited about it summary if angiography is not available non-localizing 
you don't have a choice do you have a choice friend you can't localize so that doesn't mean you won't do anything subtotal collect me with ileocline anastomosis is the answer blind segmental colectomy may produce a rebleeder who won't tolerate a major reoperation few authors have described intraoperative colonoscopy and on the table colonic lavage it's messy i have never done it theoretically it appears attractive but practically messy and time consuming if the hemorrhage is stopped it won't show much anyway so not a great role of that and that's what i want you to understand in practice these are all take homes and all of them are precious in practice we are all over investigating we know that and often long prior to operation unnecessarily this doesn't need that if bleeding continues one must operate on a well resuscitated patient you know there's no point delaying it then you can't operate on these patients who has not been allowed to deteriorate in a medical ward of course a surgical case has to be in surgical ward a physician will not be we'll just think around it nothing will happen a fast subtotal colectomy safe definitive and life saving procedure all surgery resident surgery and undergraduates who wish to grow up to become surgeons and happening people they should understand that investigations help you do something they don't do themselves anything and not operating till the patient becomes so so sick that you do nothing very very important step whether this all is right or wrong i don't give you evidence and i try to explain it scientifically the surgery is both science and art whether this all is wrong or right depends on which paper you read on what you believe your local facilities and your own philosophy i have given you what is mostly acceptable and at the end i have also given you what is most practical so be clear on that that if you are not practical with what you are saying it is not going to work this would depend on some papers say something others say something else you have to believe in what you do in your setup you have to tailor it to your facilities and then you have to have a philosophy i personally believe a neg negative laparotomy is better than a positive autopsy and i stick to that that is why we insist that we should operate on these patients early before we lose now that is to conclude and i would want all undergraduates and post graduates to remember this dictum in lower gi bleeding removing the wrong side of the colon is embarrassing and removing any segment of the colon while bleeding source is in the inner rectum is shameful so must approach by doing a rectoscopy or what you call as proctoscopy after a dre not pr exclude a cause hemos make the patient hemodynamically stable don't find a rectal cause for what you opened up an abdomen then it is a shameful thing removing the wrong side of the colon is also embarrassing that's why the subtotal colectomy so that you don't have that mistake done very very important to understand i think with that i'll conclude and i hope you could learn out of it i could share what i wanted to share if there are any questions i'll be extremely happy to address with my writing pad so that i can i can answer them by writing or explaining so please post your questions uh i'll start from below up amir shah what is massive hemorrhage i think i explained it if in 24 hours you require more than 4 units of blood or when this shock index which is the ratio of heart rate to systolic blood pressure if it is more than 1 that is uh that is uh, massive hemorrhage or roughly and crudely if you need more than 4 units of blood transfusion in the day 24 hours that's massive hemorrhage then what is okay can proctoscopy i i told you the term rectoscopy so don't call it proctoscopy definitely pick up lesions causing hemorrhage in upper rectum yes mostly it can if you can see correctly make an effort and everybody whose question is answered will type in the box that you got the answer it's very important otherwise 
we keep having the question. Let me start from the top. Your question. Typhoid ulcers and Dheeraj Kumar is asking the between the typhoid ulcers and tuberculosis. So typhoid ulcer, okay, you're answering in a pathology exam. Typhoid ulcers are in the pears patches, terminal ileum tuberculosis ulcers are also there. The, the typhoid ulcers are longitudinal tuberculosis ulcers are rounded, uh, which is, I told you, they're too small to be rounded or, or of uh, any, uh, any particular shape. Uh, we have basically the differences in terms of blood supply. The tuberculosis ulcers have the artery, artery, arteritis, so ischemic and arteritis, so ischemic ulcers. They don't bleed. Therefore, tuberculosis ulcers don't bleed. And most of the time, tuberculosis ulcers are submucosal. Now, uh, please discuss about difference between typhoid. How is the urgency relevant in lower GI bleed? I think I've covered that. The question was asked later on. No clear. Is there a role of adenine wash in the nasogastric tube in case of massive GI bleed? Pranomita Chakrabarti. Well, it has never been shown. You asked a specific case, like in carcinoma stomach. In carcinoma stomach, it won't work because adenine can only work on very small vessels. You know that, and uh, most people continue to do that. It doesn't. One doesn't know whether it works, but by and large, it can be used, and you can actually uh, use it liberally. But it doesn't work. It doesn't help, in especially the carcinoma stomach bleed. If that is what you are asking, Pranita. So in patient with lower GI bleed and abdominal pain, this is Chetan Mittal asking, should we suspect mesenteric ischemia? And if yes, how often? Well, what kind of a pain? Because if there is mesenteric ischemia, the pain would be some past history of abdominal claudication, which means postprandial pain, which is relieved on taking after the meals. So if that is there, you can suspect it. And the cause of pain in most of these patients is due to the blood filling up the bowel and causing obstruction. But yes, you can suspect it. You could suspect it only. Uh, audible in between. Now, am I audible right now? Nimesh Tiwari, you, asked, you said I'm not audible. Am I audible now? Please, all of you indicate if you can hear me. Am I audible? Madhuretti says yes. Everybody saying yes. So I think you deal with your audio then. I'm coming to the questions. It's all right. Now, Adeline Wash, I was finishing. So it has a limited role. And um, especially in massive hemorrhage, it will be washed out. It won't stay there. So I don't think it has a role. It has a role in erosions, erosive gastritis, minor, minor bleeds. Now, I was answering Chetan's question, and anybody whose question is answered, please indicate in the box. It's not often. You asked how often. That's not common. Uh, but if it happens, it's usually venous cause. So it's mesenteric vein, not ischemia. Because ischemia would produce ischemia. Why should it bleed? But venous congestion can cause some hemorrhage. Multiple clamp technique. This is by Tanya Vadhva. For how long to wait blood pooling it takes very little time it again depends on how much blood loss is there if it compared to other places if it is pulling up more that becomes a cell. i have used it personally it works very well you know you clamp the two sides you wait for it to well up it takes maybe about a minute or two it doesn't take the whole day and we are not doing it for some very very small bleeding what investigations uh, used for Ileal or lower jejunal ulcer. You don't have any investigation for ileal or lower jejunal ulcers. How would you get an investigation for ileal ulcer? You can't send a scope there, so it will be mostly suspected. And they're very small, very tiny. Surgical option to treat diverticular diseases, resection. Diverticulectomy, if it is confined to the, just confined to one segment, you can do the resection of the uh, segment of the bowel. And please, those who have got their answer, keep replying. Otherwise, I would not know. Uh, you're all saying, the voice is inaudible to Chetan Mittal. What is the problem? Am I audible now?
Chetan, is it better? Okay. Right. Then, uh, sir, in patients with lower GI bleeding, abdominal pain, that is answered. Is any role of endocapsule to recognize bleeding source, sir? I've already covered that. Endocapsule I covered. So, where were you, uh, Vishnu Vardhan? I mentioned about the wireless video capsule endoscopy. And there I described that you would get the entire sensor and everything. Please go through it. Uh, can proctoscopy definitely the question is definitely subjective most of the time it can theory of segmentation explains diabetic lies. what's the reason for angiodysplasia so av malformation they're degenerative they're degenerative malformations where av connection can happen difference between tubercular and uh, Ashish Kamatham, wonderful session, sir. Truly unparalleled. A way welcome. In a soft tissue tumor patient, when patient presented first time, how to clinically decide on FNAC? No FNAC ever. The only indication for FNAC in soft tissue sarcomas can be can be in head and neck soft tissue sarcomas because you don't want to excise. There is no place for FNAC in soft tissue sarcomas. It is always core biopsy. Core biopsy or incisional biopsy, which is the same thing. Core biopsy is a type of incisional biopsy. So there is no confusion in that. So you don't do uh, you don't do FNAC at all. You got your answer. Sahil Singha, sir. In case of wireless capsule video endoscopy, do we keep Need to keep the patient nail orally for next data. Obviously, if you keep, otherwise the capsule will be lost, <laughs> and you would miss out. No, and remember to collect it. Often you give it, and patient goes home. Then that's not done. Shirley is asking why is your dysplasia confined to the right side of the colon? Nobody knows for sure, but it's related to the vascularity. So nobody knows for sure, but more commonly, uh, I don't think I'll waste time on how much blood is required for what. Then, uh, if there's a role of adenine that is covered, tubercular type also is covered. Okay. If ileal ulcer is acid chakravarti, you have a problem there. Why is angiodysplasia confined to the... No, this is surely. If ileal ulcer is not seen in endoscopy, now we dis diagnose typhoid or tuberculosis. It is not a diagnosis you make based on gross look. If you have ever operated or been part of a surgery, you must have seen. The tubercular ulcer is not alone. It is associated with primary complex. And then I'll ask you, what is primary complex? That answer won't come. Primary complex is a combination of three things. Cones, focus, lymphangitis, and lymphadenitis. So you need, you need to find lymph node involvement. In typhoid, you don't find it. The ulcers in typhoid, have you ever seen? They rarely are seen, unless they perforate. So when they perforate, that's when you make a diagnosis of it. Okay? Uh, We have a question on 35 year old male, sigmoid colon cancer, Sunil Garg. Sigmoidectomy done in January month. Two laparotomies for pan adhesion in five months. POD4 massive GI bleeding. Upper GI endoscopy, normal rectum, normal. What, what it can be, sir? Okay. What was done? So resection and anastomosis. That's the first question. Second, was a synchronous lesion excluded by colonoscopy? Was, was the proximal source of bleeding anywhere was found? You said your patient is 35 year old and patient has got massive GI bleed, upper or lower? So lower it must be, that is what I assume. It is day four. 
on second lepidotomy. When you have banned adhesion, it is no longer the sigmoid that you're talking about. It could be ischemia or it could be an associated aneurysm. It needs to be investigated for that. So that is very, very important. Just don't be confined to uh, the Ahmed Shah. Don't. Is there any role of neoadjuvant radiotherapy in cancer stomach? See, radiotherapy has no role or limited role in cancer stomach or any organ which is mobile because you can't target it. And it's not very, very able to uh, uh, the radiation. Borhave is rupture of the esophagus against a closed cardia and the glottis also is closed. When it is ruptured, what can you do? You can't manage it conservatively. You have to go in and maybe close the perforation. If you are lucky, you are able to do a wrap with the stomach over it and survive. Otherwise, you may have to resect. It can be a tedious job. And the bleeding mostly stops, so that's not an issue. Double balloon endoscopy is, no, sir, there's a balloon endoscopy where you can use one balloon or two balloons. It is to occlude one end and so that you can keep going. It keeps the plane very clear. There's a balloon dilatation which is done along with it. With endoscopy, you can also do balloon dilatation. That's where it is used. Endocapsule covered. I'm not getting into the amount to cause hematemesis, amount to cause melina, because they're all wrong answers. They're your MCQ type of questions, which are basically wrong, because it doesn't need a particular amount to produce melina. They say 100 ml, which is the wrong answer. I'm repeating 50 to 100 ml is they're being defensive because melina would happen with mixture of uh, degenerated blood along with mucus so you can have about 100 ml as an answer but please don't get me into that it's a waste of time then we have uh, i think that part is covered most are covered great now for any part you could not hear i'm very surprised because i thought the volume was good for others so your network could be an could be an issue. Now, one question which uh, which Ahmed Shah has asked, and that you must listen to: uh, Does Melina smell, sir? As long as it is mixed with fecal matter, it will smell, and it has fecal matter usually. So most Melina smell. Will that change anything? It won't. What's the cause of smell when you fart? It is nitrogen. And that comes along with the stool. Melina would happen most a lot of cases where the blood was stagnant for some time. So there is mucus which is also acted upon by bacteria. So the longer it stays there, more it is going to smell. So it will stink. Is there a role of sigmoidoscopy in lower GI hemorrhage? Kulshan Kumar, that's a very good question. If you don't have colonoscopic facilities, and if you suspect a lower GI bleeding, sigmatoscopy can exclude the left-sided lesions most of the time. Do you know, for colorectal cancer, in, in screening, they shifted from fecal, fecal occult blood was initially there. They did colonoscopy in most cases. Then they got down to sigmatoscopy only, because it was able to pick up most lesions. And angiodysplasia are not the commonest cause. So sigmatoscopy has a role. And I hope you have understood. If you have, uh, you must write that you got the answer, Gulshan. I think that's that's it. Gulshan Kumar, you got your answer or you asked and disappeared? Double Kastrakana, Perium Anima, it's used, advantages, double contrast, Asit Chakravarti. Asit Chakravarti, the double contrast Perium Anima is air contrast Perium Anima which was in use when you could not do virtual colonoscopies. It is still in use if you cannot negotiate the scope, but you can negotiate the, the anima can go. And if you inject air, air lines the colon. Anima is white. So you can find out those minor lesions in the contrast. That's why it's called air contrast. It can be used, but we have much better ways. If you can't push in a colonoscope, your books describe the opening is less. Air contrast cinema can be done. I would do virtual colonoscopy in these cases, which is very, very effective. They all got their answers. So thank you very much.
I hope you enjoyed the session as much as I enjoyed getting it to you. It's always a pleasure, students, meeting you, talking to you, and teaching you. All I do is share my information and ignorance. Both, it's meant to be learned. Learn to be ignorant so that you can become informed and you can become wise. Now, if you enjoyed it as much as I did, please mention in the question box and we'll then wind up. Adnan Khan, we got your answer, sir. Thanks a lot for such an exciting journey. You're welcome to travel always with me, Adnan. Wonderful session, Shirley. Expecting much more. Okay. And uh, somebody wants a session on varicose veins. Too short a session. We'll see if we can adjust it somewhere. But I taught this during the uh, conference and also the PG masterclass. We'll try and put a lot of, lot of hypertension, portal hypertension, peripheral vascular disease. Now, Stalin, it's not easy to put all the PG Masterclass videos on the YouTube now because the book, they're very high definition. It's not easy. All of you keep asking this question in the group. I read everything. The instructions are passed on to Sukriti. She's implementing what I tell her. And I have a request. Don't write anything in the... Nothing absurd should come on the group. It should only be academic. And we are trying. I'm trying to put YouTube, if it is not possible, somewhere the session will appear. And that too very soon. The reason is, it is not easy uh, to put it. They are very high definition and a lot of effort goes into it. So please don't expect it so quickly. Everything should not be expected just like that. It won't happen immediately. But somewhere it will happen and you will be able to see. All right. Thank you very much. With that, with that, we conclude the session. God bless you all. Have a great day. Thank you very much.